I almost started my video today with an acoustic rendition of The Sound of Silence. Um, like, like, yeah, I, I thought better of it, so, uh, you know, don't worry, your ears will be fine. Uh, but uh, that's what NVIDIA is using for their RTX 5050 launch. So uh, we'd had rumors of the RTX 5050, but nothing concrete until it's just here on NVIDIA's website. Usually they give some sort of announcement to media, some kind of press deck so that, you know, you can have articles, videos ready to go and it's fine, they can do whatever they want. I'm just not sure that like screams confidence in this product. Now, we do have the official price. It will be starting at $249. Now I will say that the RTX 5060 uh, was announced to be starting at 299 and if I do want to buy one right now, if I just go search, uh, you know, what kind of uh, video cards are available at what sorts of prices and I search RTX 5060, sort prices low to high, there certainly are uh, models available at their MSRP. There's actually plenty of them. Maybe people actually finally woke up and aren't buying so many of the gigabyte $300 graphics cards now. I don't know, or maybe they just flooded it with supply, but the point is, that um, the 5060 is keeping its uh, $300 price point pretty well. So I don't have any reason to believe the 5050 would not be able to hit its actual launch price of 250. However, um, uh, is it worth paying that? Especially when there is only that $50 of separation. Now I know the lower you get down in these price stacks, the more $50 can be a very big deal. But again, we do need to think about the specs here in just a second. They're also announcing a release date, sort of. It's the second half of July. So uh, not being too uh, specific on exactly when we'll get this. I'm guessing they'll just start showing up on stores at some point, <laughs> we'll have to see. Because as far as I can tell, there is no planned review program for this, uh, which seems to be the case with every eight gigabyte graphics card of the 50 series. We had no review program for the 5060 Ti eight gigabyte. We had no review program for the 5060, which is eight gigabytes. And it's also looking like no review program for the 5050, which in case you were wondering, is indeed going to be eight gigabytes. Now, uh, NVIDIA's website has the specs um, kind of head to head against an RTX 3050, although you can uh, use a drop down menu to compare against some other stuff. Now, why compare against the 3050? Well, the, there was no 4050. Uh, so uh, this is the previous generation 50 class card. Now, some people would argue that there was no 4050 because it was called a 4060 despite actually being a 50 series in specs, you know, in all but name uh, and pricing. But hey, you know, it is what it is. Uh, so what do we get here? Again, we're getting to the new Blackwell architecture, uh, DLSS. Now, I don't really... <sighs> Can I just complain a little bit here about DLSS naming scheme? I've, I've mentioned this before, but I really hate this because look, they're saying that DLSS version here for the 5050 is DLSS 4, while well, they're saying on the 3050 it's DLSS 2. However, we need to be very clear that DLSS upscaling, which is what the technology actually began as, and really, in my opinion, is the most useful feature of it, uh, the 3050 does absolutely support DLSS for transformer model upscaling, but does not support the uh, multi-frame generation or indeed even the times two frame generation part of DLSS. So in general, I find that this confuses a lot of people is the fact that DLSS upscaling and DLSS frame generation are completely separate technologies that support different generations of graphics cards in different ways, and they actually do completely different things. Other than the fact that both can increase your frame rate, they are doing completely different things. DLSS super resolution lowers the internal rendering resolution of the game to make the game actually render faster, which increases response times. It does not add latency. Um, and the only downside is any potential image quality issues but the newer DLSS4 Transformer model uh, has really come a long way in making image quality, in many cases, finally actually better than native when you compare it to a native TAA implementation that is blurrier. So, um, you know, honestly, DLSS4 Transformer model is pretty great, but the 3050 does support that, even if it maybe doesn't run it as fast as the 50 series. But then frame generation, which is interpolating a frame between others, which means you have to hold another frame longer so it can slightly impact latency and certainly doesn't speed up the game and has its own image quality artifact issues and 
whatnot can still be useful, don't get me wrong, but it's an entirely different technology and in my opinion should not be called DLSS. I think calling them both DLSS is a mistake. Uh, confuses people, but maybe from a marketing perspective, that's a good thing. <laughs> Bad for the consumer though. Uh, there is next thing they have down here is AI tops, which uh, again, maybe you don't care as much for your uh, gaming setup, but again, um, things like, for example, DLSS 4, which also has ray reconstruction under its umbrella. There's DLSS ray reconstruction. We've noticed that the new transformer model for ray reconstruction, for example, does run significantly faster on 50 series GPUs than 30 series GPUs. So that is a real thing. And again, part, part of that is due to the tensor core difference being third gen versus fifth gen. Um, again, we have improvements to the ray tracing cores generationally. The NVENC encoder is going from seventh gen to ninth gen. Uh, the decoder going from fifth gen to sixth gen. But again, we're still on eight gigabytes of VRAM and it is GDDR6, not GDDR7. That's important to note because the 50 series has been GDDR7 chips all the way down up until this point. We're getting GDDR6. This had been rumored and is now being confirmed by NVIDIA. Uh, and uh, the uh, 3050 was also uh, GDDR6. Now it was an eight gigabyte model when it initially released, but NVIDIA did release a version that should not have been called a 3050, it should have been a 3040 or something, uh, because they cut down everything, not just the memory, um, to get a six gigabyte model out there anyway. And then, they, uh, uh, so, but there is still a difference in the memory bandwidth uh, due to the fact that while this is still GDDR6, it is faster GDDR6. Now, while I could do this drop-down comparison with other GPUs, I did note, and I will link all my sources in the video description, uh, that videocards.com has helpfully put together this table, which is an awesome comparison of the 5060, 5060 Ti, 5050, and 4060. So why compare with the 4060 and whatnot now? Well, um, I mean, the 4060 was a $300 graphics card. This comes coming in $50 less. The 5060 is the new $300 graphics card in this point. And it can be useful to get an idea of how performance might scale with pricing around the more recent cards that have been at least roughly in this price class. But again, also get us a, a comparison idea on performance. So the 5050, has 2,560 CUDA cores. Now, these are the 50 series generation CUDA cores, and CUDA cores are not always comparable performance-wise when comparison, uh, comparison, I can speak, guys, when comparing GPUs from different generations. But if we compare it to one from the same generation, like the 5060, these are going to be much more directly comparable in terms of their performance. Now, that being said, performance based on the number of cores does not necessarily scale linearly, meaning twice as many cores does not necessarily mean games will produce twice as many frames per second. Um, there's more to it than that. Also, there's more to the specs differences than just the core count. Uh, because again, they have the same eight gigabytes of memory capacity, but it's GDDR6 rather than seven, which means the memory clock speeds are dropped from 28 gigabits per second on the 5060 to 20 gigabits per second on the 5050. Uh, they're both on a 128-bit bus, which means that the total memory bandwidth is dropping from 448 gigabytes per second on the 5060 down to 320 gigabytes per second on the 5050. Also, the uh, TDP is dropping from 150 watts to 130 watts. But again, the price is also dropping to 250 instead of 300. Now, uh, I actually wanna pull up a calculator for a second uh, to look at something here. So if we do 2,560, the number of CUDA cores in the 5050, uh, divided by 3,840, the number of CUDA cores inside the 5060, we get two thirds or about 67%. In other words, what we're seeing here is that the 5050 has two thirds, about 67% of the CUDA cores of the 5060. Now, if we look at memory bandwidth, that's 320 out of 448. Uh, so we could pop over here. Let me actually get another line here. We can go 320 out of 448. 
uh, what we're seeing here is it has about 71% of the memory bandwidth. Now, what we're not seeing here necessarily so far uh, that I could find anywhere looking at these specs was a clock speed. Maybe did I just miss it? Let me scroll back through here. Um, yeah, I, I don't, oh wait, here we do. We do have some, some boost clocks here at clock speeds, etc. but we'll have to see how it actually performs in game here. It's a boost clock uh, 2.57. Uh, in general, what I'm trying to get at is what kind of performance could we expect? I mean, really, uh, as far as I can tell, Nvidia hasn't released any performance slides. Oftentimes when they announce a GPU, they will give performance slides. I'm not seeing that here. But given that we're getting 70% of the memory bandwidth, we're getting uh, a little less than 70% of the CUDA cores, I don't think it would be completely out of the question to speculate that we're getting significantly less performance than a 5060. Are we in the 70-ish percent of its performance range? Uh, I don't know. It's hard to tell how that will actually perform in games without testing. But when we look at price, we're seeing that it's gonna be priced at 250 out of 300, meaning it's at about 83% of the price. Which, which means if you're looking at a performance per dollar calculation, uh, you're spending 83% of the money to get 67% of the CUDA cores and 71% of the memory bandwidth. Again, if clock speeds make up for some of this or whatever, maybe you are getting 80% of the performance. We'll have to see in actual games, but there's certainly a lot of reason to believe that you wouldn't be getting 80% of the performance. So I would speculate that the 5050 is actually going to offer worse performance per dollar than the 5060. Now, uh, that's actually not unheard of as you go down um, uh, GPU product stacks. Uh, the reason is there's a certain amount of fixed cost on manufacturing a graphics card, right? Uh, like we're having to pay for the memory. Now we are dropping to GDDR6 rather than GDDR7, which should be less expensive, but you're also putting that on a PCB, which you know costs money to manufacture. You're putting a cooler on it, which costs money to manufacture. Now there's a lot of reason to believe looking at the cards that have been released uh, so far, um, that these may share some cooler designs with the 5060s, meaning the cost to actually physically manufacture the actual graphics card, the PCB, the memory, the cooler, and all of that, uh, is only right cut down, like, like a certain amount of fixed cost to that, uh, that doesn't necessarily scale with your cut down to the CUDA core count, uh, et cetera. So, um, in other words, it, it's always been the case that like, uh, sometimes as you go down the product stack, you're not necessarily getting an even performance per dollar scaling or even improving uh, because you know profit margins want to be there. Now that being said, because of how cut down this is right, going to GDR6 rather than GDR7, you are significantly cutting back the CUDA cores, uh, et cetera. I mean, who knows where the profit margins are at. Uh, it certainly doesn't seem like it's going to be an exciting product. Now that being said about the eight gigabytes of VRAM, which I've tested out thoroughly in recent videos, um, as not being amazing for, uh, you know, high settings in uh, recent releases, as you get to lower and lower prices, I start to have less of an issue with eight gigabytes. At $300, it can be like, come on, couldn't we fit in 12 gigabytes of VRAM here if we use the three gigabyte models for GDDR7 or redesigned it with a different bus width, that kind of thing. As you get closer to the $200 mark, I get more like, okay, we're talking as a super budget card by today's standards, all right. 250 is kinda right on that borderline for me. I'm like, mm. uh, uh, where, okay, I don't absolutely hate the eight gigabytes here. What I might hate is its relative performance per dollar if it seems to scale the way it does look like it would scale based on its specs. Also, we could compare it to the 4060. The 4060 has, 3,072 CUDA cores, uh, this has 2,560. Now we're no longer comparing same generation, but I will say that what we've seen with the 50 series so far is there doesn't seem to be much improvement in performance uh, per CUDA core. Now that can be difficult to isolate because there's also changes to the, uh, like I said, memory clocks, etc. Now compared to the 4060, we actually have some increase in uh, the 
memory clocks, because even though it is GDDR6, like the 4060, it is 20 gigabit per second instead of 17 gigabit per second. Uh, and they're both on a 128-bit bus, so that does mean we get 320 gigabytes per second of memory bandwidth as opposed to 272 gigabytes per second on the 4060. Also, the TDP is increased to 130 watts from 115. So again, when compared to the 5050, we are significantly cut down. When compared to the 4060, it's a bit more of a mixed bag. We have fewer CUDA cores, but slightly higher memory bandwidth and slightly higher wattage, whereas compared to the 5060, it was slightly lower wattage. Now, one thing we've seen with the 50 series is generally if they're given more watts than the 40, the 40 series counterparts, uh, they do increase their performance along with the wattage increase, but that's usually not combined with the loss to CUDA cores. I think the loss to CUDA cores here is significant enough that the increase to the wattage, which might give you higher clock speeds, etc., and the increase to the memory bandwidth, which isn't a whole lot, but is something, probably isn't going to make up for it, meaning I would expect the 5050 to be slower than a 4060 uh, if I were to speculate on that right now. Now, if we look at this number here, this is the CUDA cores compared to the 4060. So the 5050 at 2560 divided the, by the 4060 at 3072, uh, means we're getting 83% of the CUDA cores of the 4060. However, like I said, the memory bandwidth has been increased uh, to 320 over 272. So if we kind of factor that in, okay, 320 divided by 272, we're getting a almost 18% improvement to memory bandwidth, uh, but reaching 83% of the CUDA cores. So again, uh, uh, combined with the increase in wattage, et cetera, it's possible we'll at least be close to the performance of a 4060, but it's hard to tell for sure. Now, you will get the full uh, 50 series feature set, like multi-frame generation, etc. But again, um, we'll have to see how all of that plays out, and that is certainly not actual raw performance. Anyway, I'm curious what you guys think about all of this in the comments section, uh, and um, uh, yeah, let me know. Uh, is the 50-50 going to be worth it? Maybe it's a 50-50 chance. There we go. Have an excellent day, everybody.